Welcome to the Raised with Jesus podcast, 10 minutes every day where life with Jesus meets yours. You've got your daily Bible reading for August 28th, 2019, looking at the first portion of Ephesians chapter 2. Paul writes, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, when you followed the ways of this present world. You were following the ruler of the domain of the air, the spirit, now at work in the people who disobey. Formerly, we all lived among them in the passions of our sinful flesh, as we carried out the desires of the sinful flesh and its thoughts. Like all the others, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. But God, because he is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, God made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved." He also raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He did this, so that in the coming ages he might demonstrate the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance so that we would walk in them. This is the word of our God. As Paul writes from prison to the Ephesians whom he had served with, served alongside, and served as pastor for, for two years, Paul writes from prison to them. And what would he have to say? Well, the first chapter really talks about God's great love and surpassing mercy in Christ Jesus, where in Christ Jesus we have redemption, we have forgiveness of sins, we have hope, we have an inheritance because of God's eternal predestination promise carried out through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and applied to you personally through the work of the Holy Spirit in holy baptism and the Word of God. And one might wonder, is is that enough? <laughs> but Paul goes on to chapter 2, and rather than, than talking about these great and tremendous promises of God in such broad strokes, he narrows it down just a little bit. And if there were any passage, any portion of the Bible worthy of memorizing, um, the first choice would be Romans chapter 8. The second choice would be these first 10 verses of Ephesians chapter 2. They are fairly familiar. And here we have a couple of major teachings, especially about conversion, about justification, about sanctification, that is our life of good works, all brought together. And and it's easy enough to see why Paul is doing this, because the major theme of, of Ephesians is this idea of unity, that each of us, all of us together, were thought of by God, and all of us together were justified in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and all of us were brought to faith in time by the work of the Holy Spirit. And then chapter 2, we see that all of us, first of all, verse 1, were dead in our trespasses and sins. All of us. He's writing to Christians here, and he says, you were dead, dead. Um, that's very important for our understanding of conversion because we know that people who are dead or things that are dead don't do anything. A rock is not alive and it will not pick up and move itself no matter how, how strongly you preach to it and how vehemently you talk to it. Um, so the first one, you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked when you followed the ways of this present world. Um, verse 2 is this reminder that as we live in this world, it's not our eternal home. But rather, in this world, the devil has free reign, at least for a while. Um, God keeps him on a leash, so to speak. As we look at Revelation, eventually, we see a very vivid picture of that. And the, the chaining or the leashing of the devil happens when Christians hear the word of God. And the word of God is used, but that doesn't, that doesn't withdraw us from the fact that this world is the devil's domain. This world is the place where some, many, most, <laughs> still live as, as citizens of Satan's kingdom in this world, uh, the, the, the domain of the kingdom of the air. Verse 3, Formerly, we all lived among them in the passions of the sinful flesh, and like all the rest, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. Um, again, driving home this point that each person 
by nature, um, from the very moment their life begins, is by nature an enemy of God. And he says, you know, we all lived among them in passions of the sinful flesh. That is to say that we lived in the devil's kingdom. And so verses 1 and 3 talk about being dead and living among them in the passions of the sinful flesh, talking about one's status. And the result of that status is objects of God's wrath by nature, by our very nature of being humans, objects of God's wrath, which is to say that we were actually under God's condemnation, that God wasn't going to look the other way, he wasn't looking the other way, but his condemnation was hanging over our heads, um, condemned, objects of God's wrath. Verse 4 begins with that word but that's that's so often especially in these letters of paul so often um that big turning point but even though that is the case but god <laughs> god did the work why first because he is rich in mercy and secondly because of his great love for us so mercy is um is not giving someone what they do deserve. So somebody does deserve punishment, and God doesn't give it to them. Grace is God's undeserved love, and grace is giving somebody what they don't deserve. So a sinful person doesn't deserve the status of holiness. A sinful person doesn't deserve the right to inhabit heaven. But God, in his grace, gives us what we don't deserve, as well as withholding from us the judgment that we do deserve. And all of those things are answered in Christ, that God, in, st in his mercy, put his judgment on Christ. And in his, in his grace, God gave to us the righteousness of Christ. So because of those two reasons, but God, verse 4, leads us straight into verse 5, the main clause right here. God made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in trespasses. But again, he makes note of the fact that our, our natural status is that we were dead, but God's in the process of raising the dead, right? God's, that's kind of his job. That's his duty. That's what he does. God's, God's occupation is he raises the dead just as he raised Christ from the dead. So also we who are dead in our trespasses and sins have been given new life, have been made alive with Christ. And we see here again, it's like, this is this is the main reason why this section is so worthy of memorization. Not that, you know, the rest of the Bible isn't, but that this section is very handy and comes in very useful in, in discussion, especially when it comes to um, conversion or the baptism of babies. You know, this is like the number one place that I take somebody when we talk about baptizing babies. Because most often, the idea is that such a cute, cuddly baby can't surely be held as accountable before God. And Paul says, yeah, <laughs> a couple of different ways, a couple of different times. You were dead in trespasses and sins. And oh, by the way, um, being dead in one's trespasses and sins means that you are an object of God's wrath. You are prepared for destruction. But God, in his mercy, is the one who makes you alive. Um, he raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, this resurrection that God accomplished when he brought you to faith. Note, he is the one doing all the work here. There is no human reaction, no human action, no uh, response needed. That God does the work. And God's work is so complete that, um, that it's like you are seated with Christ in heaven itself right now. That you are no longer a citizen of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. You are no longer a citizen of this world nearly in the same sense as you are. The real you <laughs> is a citizen of heaven, and you've been given a throne in heaven alongside Christ that he invites you to share in his rule and his reign and because he has placed his name on you, and he has come to dwell within you personally and individually. Verse 7, he did this so that in the coming ages he might demonstrate the suppressing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The point of everything that we do is the glory of God. The point of evangelism, yeah, to bring somebody to faith, to bring them into contact with the word of God so the Holy Spirit can bring them to faith. But the overall point of that, to give glory to God. The point of declaring the law and um, and rebuking somebody, well, yes, that they would repent and that they would return to the Christian faith, that God would grant them repentance. Um, but if it, 
the the goal the glory of God. Everything that we do has the glory of God as its main goal. And that really directs our attention because then, <laughs> then what we do isn't successful or not successful based on, based on numbers or statistics or anything like that. What we do or what we choose to not do is successful based on the question of, does this give glory to God? Does this give glory to God in the truth of his word? Does this support a proclamation of the truth? And does this bring does this bring the good news of our Lord to another heart? Have we been faithful in our witness and in our use of the word of God? And if we have, then God is glorified. So then verse 8 and 9, Indeed, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And here, it's important to remember that how we define terms matters. Where biblically, grace is God's attitude, God's ongoing undeserved, attitude of undeserved love towards sinners. God forgiving sin, really, and that is God's attitude. If you define that word grace differently, as the Roman Catholic Church does, for instance, then grace is a token that is doled out by the church, and that you need to attend attend mass and confession and all they participate in all the other sacraments that they have in order to receive more tokens of grace that you basically spend down as you sin. But biblically, the biblical definition of grace is God's ongoing attitude towards sinners of undeserved love for the sake of his son Jesus Christ. And it is by this grace that you have been saved. And this grace is through faith. It's not something that you can earn for yourself. It is not by works. It is a gift straight from God because, <laughs> because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were by nature objects of wrath. We were dead in trespasses. How many times does Paul have to say this? So that he really hammers home the idea that all of these Ephesians, no matter their background, all of these Ephesians shared in the exact same starting point. And all of them were given the exact same new life by God himself through word and sacrament. And so the theme of the book that we're going to be seeing here in the next couple of chapters um, talks about unity talks about unity in every way, but he starts that, and, and there doesn't seem to be much contention there in Ephesus, but he starts this theme of unity by saying, first of all, that we are united in God's choice of us, and second of all, we are united in being objects of wrath by nature dead, and united in being given and shown God's grace and mercy as he made us alive with Christ and led us into this new life in which we now live. Worthy of memorization, wouldn't you say? You can find us tonight, 7 p.m. at 2250 South Holland, Savannah Road, Maumee. You can also find us 9 a.m., same place and same time. And um, not the same time. It's, uh, yeah, 9 a.m. on Sunday. I said that already. Um, check out the show notes for Air Wells Locator. Um, that you can type in your address and find a nearby church. There's also information about the other two churches we have in our Toledo area. Hosanna out in Monclova, on Monclova Road, and Zion Lutheran Church and School um, over on Nebraska Avenue. God bless your day.